Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord, and I'm glad to be here. I want to thank everyone. I tell you, we had a huge turnout yesterday to, to uh, work on the church. I would say this week, I mean, this is our church. If you have any free time at all this week, uh, come by the church. This is going to be a very busy week. This is a week where we're trying to get everything done so we can hold our first service back there. So 8 to uh, 5, I think... Uh, Gary and a few people have been working till 6 30, 7 30, 8 o'clock at night. And so if you have any free time to help us, come come right here. Do we have any first time visitors here? If you are, raise your hand if you're a first time visitor. Any first time visitor? No, then we have all family. So good to be here. If you have your Bibles, turn over to the book of Luke. The book of Luke. <clears throat> I was not here last uh, week. I had to preach somewhere else, and I was I, I went home last week and listened. Uh, to the sermon that Pastor preached, and then I got up early this morning and re-listened to it again as I uh, went back over my notes. And you know, life isn't fair, but I will tell you one thing about the cross. Jesus was destined to the cross, and nothing was going to keep him from going to the cross. And, and, and so, you know, we have to realize in life that we have a cross to bear. How many realizes that? We have a cross to bear. Every one of us has a cross to bear, and, 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 and hopefully it's the cross for Christ, that we deny ourselves and we take up our cross and we, we follow him. And so when you think about, hopefully we bring out some truths today about these, well, uh, this, uh, uh, these two thieves, because that's what we're going to be talking about, which thief represents, you know, your heart or our heart, I should say. And so next slide. So we, we'll get over to the next slide and we, can get, we had a little technical difficulty. So this narrative, and only Luke really gives it in detail. Uh, uh, Matthew and Mark touch on it, but only Luke gives it in detail. The narrative moves on to two thieves. Only Luke tells us about the two thieves. Both have sinned. They have been rightfully rightfully judged. But one repents while the other doesn't. Our sin is not what keeps us from God. Our problem is our inability to respond to the love of God and to repent and to change. Only one of the thieves did that. Only one of the thieves did that. So so remember that. Uh, Next slide. All right, and if you want to go home today and read your Bibles, Luke 23rd chapter is a great chapter. This is what we're going to be touching, but just parts of it. Here we go. Luke 23, 39. And one of the malefactors, which was hang railed on him, which would really, you know, when you talk about, you know, they believe they were thieves. They did something wrong. But most people say they were thieves because the word of God states that in a passage. Which were hang railed on him. In other words, probably blasphemed against him. Spoke out against him harshly. Saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Doest not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for what we receive, the due reward of our deeds. But this man had done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And some translations will say paradise. Uh, uh, so next, next slide. All right, so let's get into this, and let's, let's just do a little dive here. So facts about the first thief, and there's probably more facts, but these are the facts that I put down. He had no solid foundation. I am convinced that both thieves had heard about Jesus. There's no, no doubt the way that the fame had spread it about Jesus, that, that, that they had heard, that he had heard about Jesus. Uh, and we're going to see that because I think the second thief gives that away, gives that away. Therefore, he broke the commandment, thou shalt not steal, because they believe they were thieves. So he stowed. He railed on Jesus, which means he blasted them against Jesus. We know in Matthew 12, 31, it talks about, uh, the, the, you know, blasphemy. Therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven man, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven man. No hope for the first thief. He didn't repent. You see, when you blaspheme against the Spirit of God, and when God's moving upon you and drawing your heart, and you just continue to deny and, and continue to say that's not God, I mean, I think that's a blaspheme because you can never find repentance unless you acknowledge Christ for who He is. You, you just can't find it. So you're blaspheming against the Spirit if you're just continuing to reject the Spirit. The Spirit of God's moving. I mean, how many sit in a service and the Spirit of God has flowed and moved in the church, in, in a service and God was speaking to you, but you just didn't obey? 
We've all been there. I mean, God laid on our heart to do something. I mean, it's that small, still voice. And, and most of the time we won't do it because of pride or, or because something gets in the way of self, you know, our self gets in the way. But God speaks to us and maybe tells us to do something for somebody. You could be driving down the road. You could be just sitting in your recliner at home and God speaks to you and says, why don't you call someone but you, but you don't do it. We, we, you know, especially, you know, in America, we have become a very selfish, selfish people. It's all about me, myself, and I, if we're not careful. And, and so it's hard when we start having to give. And when you start having to give of your free time or, or you're sitting there and you're relaxed and, and God moves on you. And so that's the way the Spirit of God is. And the Spirit of God had moved upon this thief. There's no doubt about that. I mean, I mean, he was there. He'd heard about God. And, and, and he just decided that he was going to continue to stay in the state. And the reason why I know he stayed in the state, because nothing else is mentioned. And because we see the response of the second thief. And the second thief is very interesting. We're going to see some things maybe we never thought about. Next slide. So facts about the second thief. Now watch this. A lot of people don't catch this. He blasts the theme against Christ as well. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I didn't see that in Luke. We just read Luke. Let's, you know, and, and, and I, I didn't see that in Luke. Matter of fact, Luke says this. And one of the malefactors which hang railed again. He said one. So you get back over here and you look about the second thief, but you have to look at Matthew and Mark. Now they all wrote different. But you just can't, I mean, both of the, Matthew and Mark state the same thing. And I think this is very significant for us to see how marvelous and how wonderful our God is. How many knows we serve a great God? Amen, yes, a, a great God. And so he, he blasts the theme against Christ as well. Look what Mark 15, 32 states. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. That's one of the followers. Luke just didn't write it. Now look at Matthew 27, 44. It's right up here on the screen. You can check me. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. It's plural. So Matthew and Mark pick up on both thieves speaking out against Christ. That is very significant when you look at God's word. Wow, they both spoke against Christ? Luke leaves out that. But Matthew and Mark picks it up. We later find out that he fears God. He repented, and Jesus forgives him. So just hang with that thought for a moment as we continue just to build here a little bit. So the decision time. Decision time. Something happened when all three were on the cross. We see three hearts, and that's what we need to focus on. We see a hardened heart. We see a changed heart. And we see the heart of God. And Jesus said to him, and surely I say to you, today you will be of me in paradise. So when I think about the first thief and the second thief, something happened. We know that Jesus was on the cross, and we know for, uh, for three hours there wasn't darkness. But after, you can read this in Luke, there was darkness. So somewhere in that first three hours, the second thief repents. The second thief sees something about God that he hadn't seen before. Because Matthew and Mark says that both thieves reviled against him. They spoke against him. Something happened. Even while he was there, and I don't know about you, when you think about this whole, this whole picture, when you think about the whole picture of happening, I mean, life's not fair. When you think about the state of Jesus beaten, and you think about him on the cross and all he went through, and, and then these two thieves, they knew exactly what he went through because they were with him. And even the thieves in their state, they were hung on a cross as well. And I mean, when you get into certain spots, and, 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 you, and you know, there is nothing left, I mean, there's only one way to go. Uh, I guess there's two ways to go. You can stay in your misery. You can stay right there and waller in it. Or, man, you can see something that you've never seen before, and you can see God in that situation. And it's all about the heart this morning, God's people. What kind of heart do you have? Because I love this last song. I love when uh, Shiny was singing it. And there's one phrase in there that God's not going to leave us alone. I am here to tell you this morning, once you've tasted God, once you've heard the gospel and the gospel's connected with you, God will never leave you alone. If you run from God, you will be most miserable. No matter what you do, you'll think about it here and there, and it will remind you. You may go four, five, six months. You may go a year or two years. But something's going to happen because God's not going to leave you alone. And because you've tasted and because you know he's God, it's going to smack you in the face. And you're going to see how miserable you really are. 
That you're just not there. You're not there. And you're just going to run. So, so the danger about coming to church is you've got to make a decision. Right? The, da- the danger about hearing sermons that you hear f- uh, from our pastor who does a marvelous job and a wonderful job of studying and God flowing through him as other pastors that we have here. And you see that you have to make a decision because if you sit there and you never make a decision, you never find your true identity. You never find your true purpose in life. In your life. It's, a, it's remarkable when I think about the cross. When I think about the two thieves. One on one side and one on the other. And I think about the condition. And I think how they, re, they, they reviled against God. They blasted the thing against God. They were speaking against God. If you are the son of God. We think man how could you do that? The savior was sitting there right. I mean just he, he was right there with you. Now they didn't know everything in detail like we know. But they do know some things. But have you ever questioned yourself, where's God? Has anybody ever been in a situation, where's God? I can't see God in this situation, where's God? Sure, we all have. Where's God? Where's God? And so we, we think about that. So we, it's a heart thing. And when, I, when I'm talking about the heart this morning, I'm not talking about that thing that pumps blood. Uh, that's not, and matter of fact, I think 800 times in Scripture when the Bible talks about the heart, it's not talking about the heart that pumps blood. It's talking about your makeup. It's talking about your mind. It's talking about your heart, your emotions, everything that drives you, what governs you, everything about you. That's the heart. That's the heart. And that's why when the Spirit of the living God comes and moves in our hearts and our lives and touches us. It gets, into, and it gets into those emotions. It gets into those thoughts. It gets into our whole being. And before you know it, we, can be, we, we start that process of sanctification and we start becoming Christ-like. It's a marvelous thing. It's a marvelous thing to see. So we have three hearts. We have three hearts. All right. So we'll keep on building here. Now, the hard heart. How many has ever had a hard heart? Oh, we, got, well, we got a lot of honest people here. We all have had hard heart. We, we get a hard in a situation. You know what usually happens when you get hard in a situation? You think about it. You, 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 you just do over it. Sometimes you think you get past it. And then you see that individual that calls you to have the hard heart. And then all those feelings come back up again. And you, and you hold on to it. It's a hard heart. That kind of heart can't do much for God. It, 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 you just can't. Because you're not complete. Because it's remarkable to me when you talk about Christianity. And you talk about how many here has accepted the Lord as their Savior. I won't look. But hopefully all of us here, if you're not, I hope this morning you won't harden your heart. Because right now, I mean, we have a changed heart. And when you think about a hardened heart, I mean, we're, we're going to battle with things. But how can a Christian have a hard heart to be Christ-like? If there was ever a time. I mean, it is remarkable to me, and I don't want to jump ahead, but it's remarkable to me, the heart of Jesus, the heart of God. But a hard heart, if you look this word up in the Greek, it would be like the covering with a callus. Have you ever seen uh, someone that really works really hard, and you look at their hands, or they grab a hold of your hands, and, and they're just rough. They're just, that's that callus from continuing to work, and it just, it gets really, really, really just tough. I used to have those. And then I got an office job, and, uh, I, I, and now my hands hurt if I work too hard uh, physically. Uh, but the hard heart, the covering with a callous, obstrusiveness of mental discernment, dull perception, the mind of one that has been blunted with stubbornness and obduracy. I mean, it, actually, just you, it's just the way it is. I'm going to be mad because I can be mad, and I am governing my life. It's kind of that mindset. It's that mindset. I'm just going to be what I am because I can be what I am, and I'm big, and nobody can tell. Let me tell you something. Life's bigger than all of us. Amen? Life is bigger than every person here. You don't think so? You never know when something's going to knock on the door. I, 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 I were pastoring for 20-something years. I have seen a lot of different situations, and I've seen a lot of men, a lot of uh, 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 what, we, what I would call manly men. I mean, I'm... You know, just a manly man that that just, I mean, just they would work hard and everything and just really didn't have time for God. And, you know, it's something about when people get on their deathbed, how they change or they get a sickness. And most of the time it's with sickness. And I've sat by the side of many men and women who were hard people, were hard people, but through their sickness, their heart becomes soft and they just want to love everybody. 
that just want to love everybody. Hard heart. Look what Hebrews says. Hebrews 3, 8, do not be hardened. Your heart, uh, uh, do not harden your hearts as in rebellion in the day of the trial in the wilderness. This is talking about the Israelites when God rescued them from out of Egypt. And, and, and you talk about a hard heart because if you watched them numerous times, any time that something happened that was a negative, that we would perceive as a negative, it would happen. They would, they would yell at Moses. They would, they would holler at Moses. It was better if you left us in Egypt to die than to draw us out. And now look at us. I mean, it didn't take long to get to the Red Sea. You look behind, and here comes the storms. Here comes the army. Look, I was better off being one of the army than being here. Right? I was better off not being a Christian because, you see, when you say you're a Christian, it should mean something to you. And you know what the struggle is, what the rub is, when we say you're a Christian, we want to become Christ-like. But Christ-like reminds us how far we are from being Christ-like. And it rubs us wrong. No difference in the people of Israel. And this is what Hebrews was saying. In the day in the trial of the wilderness where your fathers tested me, they tried me and saw my works for 40 years. For 40 years, that, that whole generation, a generation's 40 years, that whole generation for 40 years tested God. Remember, God even got mad at them. And, and you're talking about it, but just watch the heart of God here. And I mean, God got mad where he was just going to wipe them all off. And Moses pleads with him. He says, don't do that. Can't, don't, don't do that. I mean, pleads with him. So God didn't at that time, but let me give you a little tidbit here. The whole generation died off but two. The whole generation did not make it to the promised land. Just two. Just two. And so when you think about that in their family, when you think about that, when your fathers tested me, they tried me, and they saw my work for 40 years. How many times are we going to test and try God when he's moving up on our hearts and services? How many times is God going to try and test you when you sit here, sermon after sermon, and maybe you see it, but you just don't want to grab a hold of it? That's a hardened heart. In my life, how many times has God showed, told me, hey, Paul, you need to do this, or, or Paul, I want you to do this, and, and I'm, I'm just like, you know, when I get time. When I get, you know, or, or just ignore it. I'm testing. I'm trying. God. And it says, listen what he says. Therefore, I was angry with that generation. I was angry. This is God. This is a part of God we don't like, right? We don't like an angry God. Who wants an angry God? I mean, nobody wants an angry God. I mean, if you look at the media, if you look at what the world's saying now, everybody should get along. Everybody should accept everybody. I mean, it don't no matter what. I mean, if this person did this over here, just accept them and love them. If this person did this over here, no matter what they stand for, just okay, just love them. Let's don't rub no one wrong. Let's just have everybody, everybody, let's just get along unless you say you're a Christian. All right? When you say you're a Christian, then there's, they're, they're, they're going to they're gonna poke at you. And they're gonna, but everybody else wants everybody to get along, this woke generation. Therefore, I was angry with that generation. I often wonder, is God angry at us? Does God get angry at me? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Does God ever get angry? I mean, it's, it doesn't say disappointed. It says angry angry and, and so I think about these two thieves both of them did not want to work for a living they didn't want to do something they broke the law something drove them to do that that's a heart condition something caused them and the result was they were sentenced they was tried sentenced ju- rightly so during that law and they they got what the punishment said that they were going to be hung on a cross where Jesus was there and nothing was right about his trial nothing was good as pastor brought out last week nothing was right about him he was really innocent but nothing was going to keep him from dying on the cross if Jesus would have had to hung himself, he would have, just for us, because it was prophesied, because it was, it was spoken about. I mean, it, it is the whole gospel. I mean, it's the whole Bible from front to end is about Jesus, about the coming of the promise. Is everybody with me? Say amen. All right. I'm just making sure everybody, y'all quite bunch this morning. So he says, verse 11, so I swore in my wrath, my wrath they shall not enter in my rest. That generation died off. That generation died off. The promised land wasn't that far. Matter of fact, they could see the promised land. But they just couldn't get there. The two thieves knew about God. They knew about history. They even knew about Jesus. Because I will promise you during this this day and time, there was no one, no one in that area 
No one in that region that didn't know about Jesus, about Jesus. This was a mighty move. I mean, you think about it, all that has happened. It spread like wildfire. There's nothing, nothing. I mean, they knew. They knew. I mean, just a simple fact that the second thief says, you know, you know, Lord, remember me. Remember me. He had some kind of concept, something about God. Verse 12, beware, brethren, lest there be any of you with an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. You, 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 you can, we, we can rebel, and we may think that we're escaping a living God, but we're not going to. You will never escape the living God. You will never get outside of his presence, I promise you, because his presence will be made known in every situation. But exhort one another daily. This is, uh, uh, I believe, I believe it's the Apostle Paul writing to the Hebrew church. A lot of people may not believe that, but I believe that. Uh, But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So he's talking to the New Testament church, so we know it can happen to have that heart. And how, do, how does our heart get hard through the deceitfulness of sins? Who's the deceiver? We talked about that. The deceiver is Satan. He's the enemy. I mean, he accuses us night and day. And so we see this picture coming to pass here. For we have become partakers of Christ. How many of this morning has become a partaker of Christ? If we become a partaker of Christ, then we should be growing in Christ. If we become a partaker of Christ, if we said, yes, Lord, I'm yours, our whole life should be about him. If it's not, something's wrong. We become a thief and we're robbing. We're robbing our identity. We're robbing from our identity that Christ says we should be. We have become a thief and we're stealing from the very thing that God said we should be. What did God say we should be? God said we are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Do you feel like things are new in your life? You know, I love it as a pastor. I, you see it over and over and over, don't you, brother? You see, you see people come to the altar, and they get, there's nothing like someone that really get, I mean, they get up there, and they get saved, and the joy just comes over there. There's nothing that can replace that. I mean, especially, man, if you get into a dry, dead church, and, and you preach, and someone comes up, and they give their heart, and they get up, and they're smiling, and they're clapping, and, 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 and I mean, it's like, I mean, it's just, it just sets you on fire. I remember a funny story once, and I don't know, I better watch my time here before I get to reminiscing, but I remember a funny story, and it's a true story. There was a lady that, uh, that was the, uh, in a town in California, just as a true story. I know the pastor very well, and uh, uh, I served under him as youth pastor. And anyway, this gal got saved, and she was well known in that community for a lot of things, but it wasn't godliness. It wasn't godliness. And, I, and, and she had came to a revival, and she sat on the back row, and they had, just had a fiery sermon. They was preaching. She found her way to an altar, and she started praying. She started praying. And I mean, she started just getting touched, and she started just putting her hands up, and, and God was just falling. Tears was running down her cheek, and she stood up, and everybody was clapping, but she said one thing, and everybody stopped clapping. She said, D-A-M, this feels good. Some of the older deacons grabbed the pastor after church, the pastor that I started, he said, this is just this, this not good, and he started laughing. He said, man, she's just telling the truth. She's got to grow. You've got to give her room to grow. Do you know she became his secretary at the church? Can you shout? Can you say amen? That's God, and there's some excitement there when you do that. That's why you shouldn't be a dead, dry church. I mean, I mean, how long can you sit in a dead, dry church till you realize that the church is dead and dry? Something's wrong. Is it become just a club? Well, it's my church. It's my church. And some people sit in dead, dry churches because they don't want a church to grow. Because when a church grows, it causes problems. It causes multiple, multiple problems. Why? Because you get a lot of different multiple personalities that start coming. Like mine. And people want to hold on to the small church. My church, I'm proud of it. But it's not growing. It's not a New Testament church. You read the book of Acts and you tell me that the church shouldn't grow. Read the book of Acts. I just challenge you to go home and read it. And look at the results. The church was added to daily. I mean, it grew, it multiplied. 
And so we think about that, and I don't want to start chasing rabbits. i got to get back to this message here because these two thieves, look at here. And while it said the day, if you will hear your voice, do not harden the hearts as in the rebellion. And the rebellion was the rebellion of the Israelites leaving Egypt. Don't harden your hearts like that, he says. So that's a hard heart. The first thief had a hard heart. He couldn't change. He refused to change. He reviled with no repentance. He made marks against God with no, no repentance. And, and, and don't feel bad. So have you in your life. Many of us made remarks against God. We may not think we have, but we have. The difference is we've repented. We've repented. We're here today. How many thankful for a God of second chances? Amen. All right, a changed heart. I love the book of Ezekiel, and there's one passage I just want to feed off of, Ezekiel eleven nineteen. I will, give you, uh, I will give you one heart and a new spirit. I will take from your hearts of stone and give you tender hearts for the love of God. Don't you love seeing a tender heart? I, I, I love it. I love seeing a tender heart. I love being around men that have tender hearts. I, I just the tender hearts. I and 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 I love being around oh, oh, you know uh, women who just they're not ashamed to share the gospel. They're not ashamed to let you know what's inside of them because it comes out. I don't know about you, but if we have living water inside of us, shouldn't it just burst out? Shouldn't it just burst out of us, living water, and to have that tender heart, that soft heart? How hard is it? I mean, come on, can ever is everybody with me? Let me just make a statement. Tell me if this is true. Boy, it's really easy to keep a tender heart. No. It's not. It's not. Man, I mean, we can turn on a dime, can't we? We can get a hard heart on a dime. Just, I mean, just, and give change back. I mean, keep the heart soft. You want to know what the trick, the trick, or uh, the way to to just live in a, a life that is pleasing is to have that tender heart, that heart that's always soft. It's good ground. It's not, it's not that stony heart. It's not that hard ground. It's that good ground and that, that, that soft heart. You, you, you're a bit, you, I mean, I've seen it here. I've seen when somebody's got been here. I've seen when I've got been here. Let me tell you something. I've got been a few things. And, 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 and you know, I have to pray and I've got to watch myself because I'm a very readable person where somebody says, hey, what's up? What, what's going on? I'm very readable. Hey, is something bothering you? See how it shows? Because your heart, if you're not careful, your heart will get really hard. And, and I've seen people here, even in this church, don't crucify me. I'm helping you out. Just accept it. That at times we all can get a hard heart if we're not careful. Just that fast. And I want to tell you today, I want you to have a soft heart. I want you to have a heart. Something happened to this thief. Uh, you know, uh, those first three hours, there had to be the first three hours because there was darkness the next three hours, you see. So it had to be the first three hours. Something happened to this thief where he wasn't reviling against God anymore. But listen, I mean, I'm telling you, the second thief repented in the first three hours. He understood his sin, and he seen Jesus as the answer. He understood his sins. He had some understanding about the kingdom because he asked Jesus to remember him. Remember him. And remember, but you know, Lord, remember me in your kingdom, your paradise. People want to talk about paradise and kingdom. I don't even want to go down that road because I can't even comprehend it. But I will tell you this much. Paradise or kingdom is a lot better than the earth, right? That's what I'm going to tell you. I, I can tell you. He said, this day, remember me in your kingdom or in paradise. Remember me. I want you to know he already knew. See, he knew something about that. Why would he ask it if he didn't know it? But he was one that was reviling against God according to Matthew and Mark. But he changed. Do you know even, and I, and I challenge you not to wait that long. But, but Jesus, he gives a little parable about the wages, you know. Some might work all day, some might work part of the day, then some might only work an hour, but they all get paid the same wages. I challenge you not to do that, but I can tell you what is so remarkable is that God, even on your deathbed, can, 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 can make you have a soft heart to accept him. What a love. So you, you see the second thief's heart. He had a change of heart. I don't want to be, uh, uh, you know, go back to being hardened, that stubborn, that I'm just going to be this way because be, I, I don't like Paul, so I tell you, I'm not even going to shake his hand after church. I, I don't like this preacher. I don't like what he's saying, and I'm just going to stand my ground. I don't even want to be around him. He, I just don't even like him. It can happen. It can happen. 
And it happened so quick, quick. But I'm thankful that God can change that stony heart. And I, and I got to, and that's why Paul, he writes, he says, guard your hearts. That might have been Timothy, uh, 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 Paul, uh, yeah, was Paul said, guard your hearts, guard your hearts. So heart is your inner person, your mind, your emotions, your actions. It's when everything that comes out of you is your heart. It's not what goes in a man and it follows him or what comes out. I mean, we see a lot of things that come in us, but what comes out is our heart. That's the conditions. That's the emotions. That's everything. It's what comes out of us. That's your heart. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's what comes out of a person. You can see what's in people. We better wind this thing down. The heart of Jesus. Everybody like this one. The heart of Jesus. How many, how many is thankful for the heart of Jesus? Yeah, yeah. Come on, give me my hand. Give me my hand of praise. A good hand of praise. Yes. Close with a few truths here. So, Luke 23, 24. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the whole crowd at the moment. I'm just I'm going back up into Luke here. That's why I challenge you to go home and read. They part, departed his raiment and cast lots. The heart of Jesus. Why was Stephen able to say the same thing being a deacon? Remember, they rushed up on him. They threw rocks at him. They stoned him. They bit him. They did all kinds of things. And Stephen, the first martyr, he cried up and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Where did he get that from? Jesus said right here, Luke 23, 24. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Now there's all kinds of implications there. The very fact that they did not know what they did was they didn't know they were doing it to the living God. They didn't know they were doing it to the perfect sacrifice, if you will. That this was the Son of God. But Jesus is still crying out, being tormented, being beaten, being bleeding. I mean, just hurting, aching. He's still crying out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a God we serve. Luke, Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said to him, this is to the second thief. Verily, remember the second thief asked him, remember me in thy kingdom. And Jesus on the cross, still not being selfish, still not worried about himself. Even after this guy, this, this thief railed against him. Even after this thief was poking at him. I don't know how hard he did, but I know that he was a part of it. If you're the son of God, then take yourself off this. Deliver us. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, today y'all shall be with me in paradise. Even on the cross, in the state he was, we see the heart of the triune God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. We see something happen here so remarkable. So remarkable. We see the heart of the triune God and the promise to all mankind on the cross being fulfilled. This had to happen. It, nothing could have stopped this from happening. Nothing, nothing could have stopped the two thieves being on each side. Because it was already prophesied that would happen. Nothing could have held this event back in history. Not a nuclear bomb, not, not, not a military. Nothing could have stopped the love of Jesus. Nothing could have stopped the love of God, that triune God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Nothing could have stopped it. Nothing could have stopped it. We see a huge heart. We see what comes out of Jesus on the cross. On the cross. We see everything that comes out of him. And it's about forgiveness and blessing. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Amen. Come on, group. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What a marvelous time we as Christians celebrate this, this whole month, really. When you talk about Easter, you talk about, you know, uh, the events that lead up to Easter. And for, uh, for us as Christians, we all should be shouting. This, this week coming up should be a joyous week for everyone because we know the heart of Jesus. God's people, I cannot ever close a service out without asking, you know, just simple question. 
And then, are you sitting here today and your heart's hardened and you just don't know the Lord? You, 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 you've not surrendered to him. Is there anybody that, if, if there is somebody, I'm just going to ask you to find a way of prayer as they come and begin to play. But I want to go a little deeper, dive a little deeper this morning. Is it possible that we're sitting here today and there's some of us that might carry things and have a hard heart in situations? We're just, we're steadfast, we're just, we don't want to be moved, but God spoke to you this morning that it's time to move. That God spoke to you, you was that thief on the cross, 